Okay, perfect. So I'm with the American Association on Health and Disability, and this webinar is on the Medicaid unwinding and, unwinding and what advocates need to know. So we have Carl Cooper, who's the director of our public health programs on, and then Arthi Patel, who is our health and our public health intern. So we're just going to be um, going through the slides and everything. We have a Q&A open. Folks can put questions in as the slides are going through. But once we finish the slides, that's when we'll open up the Q&A. Um, and then if you want to put in the chat just where you're from um, and what organization you're with, that would be great. Obviously, this is going to be kind of like a state by state review. So it is nice to kind of have that perspective and knowing where everyone is from. Um, and then I have a poll question. I'll wait a little minute to launch that up, but I will just turn it over to Carl Cooper if he has anything to add, and then Arthi to you as well. well. We want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is um, uh, a presentation talking about what advocates really need to know about the Medicaid unwinding. We know there's a lot of information out there, and we want to make sure that people are getting accurate information and uh, a lot of Medicaid is different from state to state as a national organization. We don't uh, necessarily know exactly what's happening in every state, but we do want to look at some of the states and specifically how some of them are handling certain things. We'll be getting into some maps uh, that sort of demonstrate uh, what all the states are doing as it relates to their unwinding. Uh, and we are also going to be um, uh, looking at two specific states and sort of a side-by-side -side comparison uh, and what they're doing. And then we'll also be talking generally about um, some of, uh, you know, what people need to know and how they can help uh, Medicaid recipients, make sure that they're navigating uh, this process correctly and making sure that they're hopefully then not losing coverage as a result of the unwinding. There's been a lot of uncertainty in the area and a lot of concern that uh, sort of this uh, high level uh, uh, event that we're going through with so much happening with Medicaid eligibility determinations that unfortunately probably some people are going to lose coverage as a result and many people are going to lose coverage that shouldn't lose coverage and we want to make sure that folks are doing what they need to do to make sure that they can maintain that coverage uh, and how you as an advocate can sort of help as well. Um, as uh, Nuria said, uh, since this is uh, very state to state, we do want to have an idea of where people are from. I see uh, people are already putting that into uh, the chat, so that's very helpful to have. Um, we will, like I said, we'll be getting into some of the uh, state-specific maps in a moment, and uh, you can be looking for your state and how your state's handling certain things in some of those state-by-state -state maps, and uh, we look forward to having this conversation with everyone. At this point, um, I think, uh, Nuria, I think we can go ahead and launch the poll question, just so people get an idea of how to use that. Perfect. And then also for folks who just have, we do have an ASL interpreter on, and then we do have a someone doing closed captions. So with the recording, we'll have that and then the closed captions as well for whoever needs that. Okay, so the poll question, again, just to get people acclimated with this, um, just how's everyone doing today? I have amazing, all right, and could be better. I hope everyone's day is amazing, but being realistic, adding other options in there. So. And I'll just leave that open for like 20 seconds or so. Meantime, I'm seeing a lot of different people from uh, all over the country, lots of different states represented. So I uh, look forward to having a good conversation. Yep. And then just on the poll, as expected, a good chunk of all rights and some amazings that could be better. I hope your day goes better after this webinar. I hope you gain some information and some insight. Maybe that's not what's going to make your day amazing, but um, it, it could help. And there is another, we'll be talking about it in the end of the slides, but there is a, another Medicaid unwinding focused webinar later today at 730. So we'll share more of that information um, for folks in the end but I will just go ahead and end the webinar. Glad to see that a good chunk of people are doing well today. Or I'm sorry, end the poll, not the webinar. Ending the webinar. I know, yeah. So, yes. <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, and talk about this and, and get into this important topic. Uh, first of all, many of you may not be familiar with our organization, so I just want to sort of do a little bit of an introduction as to who we are as an organization. We're the American Association on Health and Disability. 
Uh, it's our mission statement to ensure health equity for people with disabilities through policy, research, education, and dissemination. We are a cross-disability organization, so we look at all disabilities, whether it's physical, intellectual, developmental, uh, sensory, uh, or mental health. Any disability uh, is what we're looking at, and we're also looking at it across the lifespan, so not focusing just on children or just on older adults, but all across from infant all the way uh, to older adults. And there are uh, five main ways we try to work to achieve our mission statement. We work to reduce health disparities for people with disabilities. We advocate for community inclusion. We work to promote full accessibility in healthcare settings and public health programs. We also work to integrate disability into the broader public health agenda. And we work to advance knowledge translation and disability research. And really it's a lot of these uh, sort of touch on this particular issue in terms of reducing health disparities. Obviously, if people lose coverage, that's gonna create more disparities. Uh, and this particular, um, this particular uh, project that we're working on with talking about the Medicaid unwinding obviously is uh, a public health issue as well. So we're really trying to make sure that people with disabilities are included in these kind of initiatives. So this, uh, this kind of work really fits right in with uh, the work we do all the time. Now, as it relates to Medicaid determinations, uh, many times I, I, I put this slide up and I feel like I need to be like a uh, doing a voiceover for a, a film trailer, you know, in a world where uh, we are in the process of coming out of the pandemic and people are losing health coverage. Uh, that's sort of where I feel like. Uh, so when I have this up here, it's coming to a state Medicaid agency near you. Uh, so uh, if you aren't already in the process of receiving these sorts of things, uh, it really um, it is coming and it is in the process. Many people are already uh, starting to lose coverage. Um, and uh, so we want to make sure that we're maintaining and looking at uh, what's going on. So um, like we said, Medicaid does differ from state to state. So it's a little bit, uh, there is some large scale stuff we'll be talking about, but some of this is also state specific. So we'll uh, try to sprinkle in some of that as we go through. But let's first of all, take a step back. How did we get here? Uh, you know, it's it's sort of a, an important thing to remember exactly what led to this. This has really been a three year process when you really think about uh, what has led us to this uh, fact of the Medicaid unwinding. So we'll be taking a little journey from March of 2020 all the way through uh, uh, last month of April 2023. Um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, was signed into law on March 18th, 2020. It was one of the first um, relief bills that was signed into law and passed by Congress and signed into law uh, that related to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and was really had a lot of things it was intending to do. There was a lot of provisions in it. I'm not going to obviously get into all of them, but it included provisions on uh, getting COVID testing, having people get paid sick leave. It expanded unemployment for those people that were out of work because of shutdowns. So it did a lot of those kind of things. But in there as well, one of the, the provision that sort of led us to where we are today is it provided additional funding to states for Medicaid programs. Now, it's important to remember that Medicaid is what we refer to many times as counter-cyclical. What that essentially means is, as the economy is doing well, Medicaid enrollment goes down, but when the economy isn't doing as well and it's struggling, Medicaid enrollment actually goes up. So the, the states, when their revenue is dropping because incomes are down because of a, a downturn in the economy, they're actually ended up spending more money on Medicaid. So it sort of goes against what you're trying to do. And it can be very challenging for states to sort of navigate uh, difficult times economically. Um, and so states were concerned about the fact that if people were losing their jobs, uh, they were ultimately going to end up having to pay more money out for Medicaid. And they were looking at lower revenues because those same people wouldn't be working and paying income taxes. So uh, that was the concern states had going uh, into this process in March of 2020 as things started shutting down. So what did they start to do? What did they try to do to sort of overcome that? Well, the state government decided, or excuse me, the federal government decided that what we're going to do is help the states run their Medicaid programs by providing additional fundings uh, to them to help them pay for the, the potential uh, increase in enrollment that was going to happen. So uh, that's something that we got to always sort of keep in mind. Um, and the but the trade off was uh, that yes, states were going was were going to get this additional funding. But the trade off was that Medicaid programs 
had to offer continuous coverage as long as the public health emergency continued. That's the way the law was written in 2020. So basically, it was the federal government giving them the carrot and the stick. The carrot being, hey, we're going to give you these extra dollars to help run your state Medicaid programs. But the stick and making sure that what you're doing is you've got to make sure anyone that gets enrolled on this program, you can't kick them off as long as we're in this situation of this public health emergency. Uh, and not only that, there was another provision that's just as important, and that is it required state Medicaid programs to maintain benefits for enrollees, when many times referred to as the maintenance of effort provision. Uh, in other words, states had to continue to cover everyone and to save dollars, they weren't allowed to sort of scale back on what sort of things they were going to be paying for. So whatever they were paying for prior to the pandemic, they had to continue to pay through for as we went through the pandemic. So uh, those were all sort of important provisions that were included in uh, in this um, law that was passed in March of 2020. But that then created this dynamic where states had to continue paying for these uh, beneficiaries, uh, some of which some people may have gone back to work since. So the question was, did they really were they still eligible for Medicaid um, when once they uh, went back to work and the closure stopped and all that kind of stuff? So that's sort of uh, the that's the the where we were set um, as of March of 2020 and as we went through the pandemic. But obviously, the pandemic no one envisioned in March of 2020 that it was going to be the public health emergency was going to continue for months and months and months. Um, so that created a new issue in terms of now we've got all these people on here, um, and when is this public health emergency going to end? Well, the public health emergency obviously continued and it kept going on and on. Um, many people don't realize, but the public health emergency actually was declared relatively early in the process. It was declared well before um, the shutdown started. The public health emergency was actually declared on January 31, 2020 by HHS and ultimately then was renewed multiple times. So it was renewed three times in 2020. It was renewed four times in 2021 and 2022. And then it was uh, you know, renewed again in January of 2023. Uh, now, this sort of uh, length of how long this went on was, was a really a great thing for Medicaid beneficiaries because during that whole time, they knew they weren't going to be losing their coverage. It led to record enrollment in the Medicaid program and also what we refer to as a lack of churn. Churn is a terminology that gets used in the Medicaid program for those folks that sort of are right on the edge of whether they're eligible or not because their income fluctuates and goes up and down. So, so sometimes they might be eligible for it because their income is a little lower. Other times if, they're, uh, if their income is up, then they become ineligible. So you have this degree of what's referred to as churn where people are going on and off of Medicaid constantly. And it can really lead to a lot of complications as to how people receive their um, their coverage and how they interact with the healthcare industry. Um, according to uh, Kaiser in 2018, over 10% of Medicaid um, recipients had gaps in their coverage due to Medicaid churn. And this virtually eliminated that uh, kind of idea because coverage had to be maintained throughout this whole time. The only reason that people, um, or excuse me, that states were allowed to uh, terminate coverage was if someone moved out of state. So uh, most folks were maintaining that coverage and were staying on. So then ultimately, uh, the public health emergency did end just a couple of weeks ago on May 11th, 2023. But there was uncertainty as to what was going to happen with this if we turn back the clocks to the end of last year, 2022. So what did Congress do? Congress decided to go back and change uh, the, how this was going to work. And that brings us to the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. So we're talking about the law that was actually um, passed and signed into law at the end of last year. It was passed by Congress and ultimately signed into law on December 29th, 2022. 2022. Um, and ultimately it ended up uh, setting some things as it relates to how the Medicaid continuous coverage requirement was going to continue as you moved forward. So the first thing it did was it, de it did do that. It decoupled the Medicaid continuous coverage requirement from the public health emergency. States were wondering, when is this going to end? The public health emergency was, by law, had to be extended every 90 days. So the question was always, well, is this going to be the 90 days when it's going to end? 
Um, is it going to end at the end of this? And then it would get extended again. So they knew it was another 90 days. And it was that uncertainty that was really, I think, causing difficulties for state governments to really plan how this was going, how this was going to work. So they, um, you know, that was one of the things that came up and, and Congress decided, let's, let's take it out of the arena of the public health emergency and let's just go ahead and set a date for the end of this. And that's exactly what happened with the uh, Appropriations Act that was signed into law at the end of the year. So it did set the date for the end of the Medicaid continuous coverage requirement as of May, uh, March 31st, 2023, which then of course meant that as of April 1, 2023, states could start terminating coverage for folks who were no longer eligible for the program. Um, now there were some uh, things that uh, specifically that uh, Congress had done to make sure that states were gonna do this in a responsible way. And sort of once again, the carrot and stick idea, the carrot in this is that they did provide a phase down for the increased uh, federal matching percentage or what's referred to as the FMAP for states through the end of 2023. So those extra dollars that the federal government was giving to states to run their Medicaid program, those were going to be phased down um, throughout the rest of this calendar year. And that was just to essentially ensure that states were going to do this in a responsible way and weren't just going to start kicking people off um, haphazardly. So that was sort of the enticement they had to do it appropriately. So now let's talk about exactly how states are doing this. How are states handling uh, this um, process? How are they handling the unwinding? And we'll sort of look at some of the state by state uh, maps that we've got for you. So the first question is, when did, starts, when did states start reviewing um, folks for exactly when they were going to be um, eligible for their um, what, when they be, whether they were still eligible for Medicaid. So states started this process over the last few months. Some of them started it in February. So there were eight states uh, that are color coded in blue on this map uh, that started it. Um, since that's a smaller number, I'll go through real quickly. So from west to east, we're talking about Idaho, Arizona, South Dakota, Iowa, Arkansas, Ohio, West Virginia, and New Hampshire. Those are the states that sort of started doing it already back in February. 18 more states, the ones that are color coded in orange, started that process in March. And then 25 of them started that process. So the other half essentially started that process in um, April. Uh, and those states are in green on this map. So you can sort of see that over the last three months, um, you know, most, not most, all of the states have sort of started this process. Um, in one way or another. Now, how they're all doing it is very different. So let's talk about the more important date, actually. And that is, you know, this is when the, the reviews started, but when did states actually start terminating or will they start terminating coverage uh, for people that no longer qualify? And that provides a lot more different sort of responses. And there are five different uh, months that this started occurring. Five of them, five states started terminating coverage as early as April, uh, so last month. Uh, those five states, uh, once again, west to east, were Idaho, Arizona, South Dakota, Arkansas, and New Hampshire. Uh, those were the state; those were states that started terminating it that early. Um, Fifteen states um, that are color coded in orange on this map started uh, terminating coverages uh, this month. Um, so. Uh, those are the states that um, are now just starting that process. 21 of them, so the vast majority of states, are going to start terminating coverages next month in June. Uh, so once again, be looking at these, finding your states. The states in green are the ones that are going to be starting terminating coverages next month. Nine more states are starting to terminate coverage as of July. So you've got another uh, a little over a month until those starts, the, excuse me, until those states start to terminate coverage. Uh, and those are the ones color coded in purple uh, on this map. And then there's one state that is actually not going to start terminating coverage until October, and that's the state of Oregon. Uh, so that's uh, sort of the sort of the range of where the states are in terms of deciding when they will start to terminate coverage. So you can see there is quite a bit of uh, discrepancy between each of these states in sort of how they are going about this process. Um, and once again, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge uh, RT and Nerea. Uh, they were the ones that went through all these state unwinding plans that were filed with the federal government to find the answers to some of these questions. And it's really starting to get, it really gets important when we look at questions like, 
how long do beneficiaries have to respond? Um, and in this instance, there is a wide variety, once again, on how much time people have, going all the way from not up to 90 days that people have to respond to an eligibility determination or redetermination uh, down to 30 days. Uh, so there really is a vast difference in that. So the states that are in blue um, is the highest number, whereas 90 days uh, people have to respond. So they have three months to sort of complete their um, their renewal. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the, you know, the longest time period. Uh, the next longest is 60 days. Those are the states that are in orange. There are 11 of those states uh, that give people essentially two months uh, to complete a renewal application and make sure that they can uh, stay uh, redetermined to maintain their eligibility. The green states then are only giving 45 days, so that's a month and a half. Um, there's eight of those states uh, that are looking at a 45-day window. And then uh, the purple states, uh, are th there's six of them, only provide 30 days. Uh, so it's only a month uh, that people have uh, to determine. Unfortunately, there were nine states where we couldn't get more specific info for. Um, and uh, so those nine states are color-coded in white on this. If anyone is from one of those states and you sort of know, we'd love to know that information. So if you want to drop that in the chat, uh, we're happy to uh, update this to include the, that information. Uh, those nine states, by the way, um, once again, west to east, are Wyoming, New Mexico, North Dakota, Kansas, Iowa, Louisiana, Alabama, Ohio, and North Carolina. So um, those are, like I said, those are the states that we are still uh, trying to get information for, but uh, that's an important part because it's not just a matter of when they start the um, renewal application process, but how long do people have to respond? And some of these that are uh, tighter timelines, it's important to know that because once you get that, you know, hey, I've only got a month to complete this. So making sure that people are aware of that, I think is important. Another thing we really wanted to sort of take a look at was, you know, how long do beneficiaries have to, uh, excuse me, how are, excuse me, how are states doing as it relates to uh, disability eligibility? We know that there are multiple ways uh, for people to get Medicaid coverage. Some of that is through the Medicaid expansion. It's purely based on your income. Some of them is based on a disability eligibility determination. And those folks are going to potentially have to go through the same renewal process, and states might be dealing with those folks differently. So we asked the question, um, are states doing this uh, differently based on eligibility determination? Are they going to be reviewing those people right away? Are they going to be waiting? Are they going to be doing them with everyone else? And uh, there are uh, some states that uh, did this um, in different ways. Um, the first, the states in blue, uh, which would be uh, Washington, Nevada, Utah, South Dakota, Arkansas, Alabama, Florida, and South Carolina. Those are the states that are reevaluating people that have a, uh, they have eligibility due to a Medicaid, uh, el excuse me, due to a disability determination. They're doing those first. Uh, so those are the folks that uh, are, we really should be thinking about because they're the ones probably going through this process right now. Uh, 37 of them are actually going to reevaluate them with everyone else. They're not going to necessarily do them sooner. They're not going to do them later. They're going to be doing them with everyone else. So that's the vast majority of states, and those are color-coded in orange on this map. So those states, they're doing everyone all at once. Um, then there's one state that's in green where they're going to be reevaluating people last, and that's the state of Texas is sort of going to wait, they're going to do all the other determinations, and then they're going to get to people that are on Medicaid due to a disability determination. There are three states where there is sort of a special circumstance going on. It might be related to the type of disability um, evaluation or disability determine, excuse me, disability eligibility determination uh, that they have. But there's three states, meaning Alaska, Arizona, and New York, that are sort of doing this on a, a special circumstance uh, and you have to get into more specifics on those states to understand exactly what they're doing. And then there were two states um, with Wyoming and New Mexico where we couldn't find specific information on them as to how they are addressing uh, disability eligibility and how they're doing them in terms of the, um, the, the, the timeline. So those are all some state-by-state -state maps that show you sort of how some of these states are doing these things differently. Um, and uh, But we really need to take a step back for a moment and look at, well, 
who are we talking about now? Who could potentially lose coverage as a result of all this? Well, first of all, let's look at the broad number. Um, as of uh, January 2023, over 93 billion people uh, got their coverage through Medicaid and or the CHIP program. So uh, those are all, um, that, that's the, those are the people that are now in the process of going through this redetermination. Uh, that's a lot of folks. And that means there's a lot of people that could potentially be losing um, Medicaid. How are we, how is this potentially going to affect the disability community though? Well, according to HHS, 37.2% of people with disabilities receive their coverage through Medicaid. It is by far, not, I shouldn't say by far, but it is the highest number of, uh, it's the highest percentage number of coverage for people with disabilities. It's higher than uh, folks with disabilities that are on Medicare. It's higher than uh, folks with disabilities who get private coverage, either through an employer or a family member's coverage or something like that. So it is the highest percentage of um, coverage for people with disabilities. Um, and importantly, uh, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, they estimate, uh, it's a broad estimation, anywhere between 8 to 24 million people could lose coverage over the next year. Uh, and that is a, that's a large group, um, and that's a large uh, gap. And a lot of this is dependent on how states do this uh, redetermination effort. Now, we know that there's some people that probably no longer do qualify. Uh, they were out of work during the pandemic. Um, and that's what they were now qualified to get on Medicaid because of that. Uh, now, because they're back to work, because uh, the pandemic, quote unquote, is over. Um, be, since that's the fact, then we can potentially see those people going back to work. Their income is probably now back at a point where they wouldn't be eligible. So some people legitimately are no longer going to be eligible for Medicaid and are going to lose coverage. But there is a large group of people that could potentially lose coverage that aren't necessarily um, should lose coverage. There are a lot of folks that could potentially lose coverage um, that are going to lose coverage because they didn't complete their forms in time or because uh, you know the correct information didn't get sent to the state Medicaid agency regarding their income. Uh, or if it's based on a disability determination, uh, the correct medical records or whatever weren't sent in to be able to maintain uh, that coverage. There's a lot of procedural reasons why people could potentially lose coverage um, where they shouldn't lose coverage. And those are really the folks that we're the most concerned about. But this could potentially also be just a communication thing that we need to make sure that we're addressing as well. Because the Kaiser Family Foundation also did a recent survey that just came out this week that really looked at what are Medicaid recipients saying. They polled Medicaid recipients to see what their understanding of the Medicaid unwinding is. And some of the numbers were uh, sort of uh, eye-popping in terms of the results they got. First of all, 7% of people that they polled said they didn't think states are still aren't permitted to remove people. So they didn't even realize that they could lose Medicaid coverage. Uh, they thought that states still had to maintain coverage as they were doing beforehand. When they asked that question, 65% of people weren't sure. So you have over 70% that don't realize what is actually happening right now. That's a huge number when you think about it. Another number that's really big as well is that 47% of folks that receive Medicaid have never been through a renewal process like this before. If you go back before the pandemic, uh, Medicaid renewals were done all the time. Uh, people always had to show that they were still eligible for the program. Uh, so almost half of Medicaid recipients that are currently on Medicaid have never been through that process before. So this is going to be entirely new to them, and they're not going to realize that they have to do that. 33% of the people that the Kaiser polled had not updated their contact information with their state Medicaid agency over the last year, uh, which obviously if they're then uh, not getting the renewal application because it gets sent to the wrong address or it gets delayed because it gets returned and then the Medicaid agency has to send it out again, uh, that could potentially really cause problems, especially if you're talking about one of those states that only gives people 30 days to re respond to the renewal request. So that's something else to really be thinking about is that uh, there are a lot of folks over a third that or around a third, I should say, that haven't updated that information. When they did ask, 65% of uh, recipients did say their, their circumstances haven't changed since uh, they got on Medicaid. In other words, their income is still the same as it was. So those are folks that, you know, presumably should still be eligible for Medicaid. 
Um, and there may be people that their circumstances did change, but they're still going to be eligible for Medicaid. So there is a vast, the vast majority of people that are going through this should maintain their coverage once they come out of it. And then over 40% of people wouldn't know what to do if they did lose coverage. And that's another one that I think is really, uh, you know, we're talking about almost half the people are talking about, you know, what happens if I lose coverage? Uh, you know, I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know where to turn. Uh, they don't they don't know what options they have. Uh, so that's another important thing that we'll be getting into in a moment. Like I said, this was a poll that just came out from the Kaiser Fam Family Foundation earlier this week. So I put the link here uh, that you can go ahead and check that out. We're going to be putting a news item up on our NDNRC website about this because we think this is an important, uh, this is really an important a uh, poll that really, I think, gives a good picture of where Medicaid recipients are right now and their understanding of what we're going through. So at this point, though, we do want to sort of do just do a, uh, a sort of a mini uh, comparison in terms of what's going on from state to state. So uh, Artie, uh, who has uh, been great at helping us go through all of these state plans and uh, is our public health intern, uh, she's uh, writing a paper for one of the classes she's in that really is looking at a state-by-state -state comparison for the Medicaid unwinding. Uh, and Artie's going to walk us through that now uh, to talk about the differences between Arkansas and Virginia. So Artie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Carl. So um, looking at a state by state comparison, um, as Carl mentioned in this presentation, current state run re redeterminations run the risk of people with disabilities losing their Medicaid coverage. And an explanation for this is that people with disabilities are more likely to face challenges due to barriers in accessing information in the necessary formats. So um, this two-state comparison of Arkansas and Virginia's Medicaid programs, resources, and current state of redeterminations, um, we're gonna dive into right now. So looking at the resources, we can see that Virginia has a statement of reasonable uh, accommodations for people with disabilities available easily through their Medicaid homepage, while Arkansas has this statement embedded in their PDF application. Um, Arkansas's Medicaid website also does not have any information on accessing renewal information and braille materials, while Virginia's website does. Arkansas also only offers their Medicaid homepage in English, while Virginia offers their homepage in 15 different languages. And Arkansas's online application is available only in English, while Virginia's online application is available in 100 different languages. So, also looking at the redetermination trackers, um, unlike Virginia, Arkansas does not have a Medicaid redetermination tr tracker available for the public. This shows that there's a potential lack of transparency and accountability in Arkansas's Medicaid program. So showing that Arkansas fails to provide equitable resources for Medicaid enrollees with disabilities to the caliber that Virginia does, this means that these individuals are more likely to lose Medicaid coverage during this redetermination process. Um, could you move to the next slide? Thank you. So um, for the as of last month in April 2023, Arkansas closed 72,802 cases out of 134,038 total redeterminations. On the other hand, Virginia closed 9,423 cases out of 138,651 redeterminations completed. So it's important to show that um, the Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that 196,800 people could lose Medicaid coverage in um, Arkansas uh, because we couldn't find the number of um, people with disabilities who lost the, the Medicaid coverage in Arkansas. Um, we can sh I can show you that the category of people that lost coverage in Virginia is 823. The fact that we could find this information for Virginia but not Arkansas just shows that Virginia has a lot more transparency with the public about their redetermination process compared to Arkansas. So um, this the Virginia's Medicaid unwinding tracker breaks down the number of disenrollments and renewals by population, and they include a category for people with disabilities. So the 823 people with disabilities who lost their Medicaid coverage in April was out of the total 900, or sorry, 9,423 total cases that were closed. 
Um, although Arkansas hasn't provided how much information um, and much information on how many people with disabilities have been disenrolled, it's important to note that they were, as Carl stated earlier, Arkansas was part of the, the, the population of states that indicated that they'll be reevaluating re this community of beneficiaries first. So they were reevaluating people with disabilities first. So out of those 72,802 cases closed, we don't know how many people had disabilities. So this indicates that the Medicaid beneficiaries with disabilities in Arkansas are at a higher risk of losing coverage due to not a potentially inequitable redetermination process, as I showed earlier with the lack of resources in Arkansas compared to Virginia. Yeah, you can move to the next slide. So now I'll pass it off to Nuria, who will talk a little bit more about how advocates can help. Okay, thank you, Arthi. So yeah, I just want to again thank Arthi for helping us with those um, maps and just able to visualize and contextualize all that information. It's a great feat to go through all 50 states. And of course, I'm sure everyone on this call has heard once you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state Medicaid program. So it's totally not the same thing. Um, and we're just trying to kind of demystify that whole process through this entire presentation. So again, props to her um, and, you know, Carl for just kind of presenting that so concisely. So just kind of jumping into, again, how can advocates help? So this could, you know, you could be an advocate for people with disabilities or you yourself might be going through this process. That's kind of the main, you know, goal of our outreach strategies towards this. So we're just going to go over some tips for making sure patients can maintain that coverage. And again, just as a reminder, um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. We're about 40 or half an hour into the presentation, so we will be roughly in about like 10 minutes or so going through any questions that folks might have. Um, and then I, Brittany did drop in the chat um, that Ohio does have 90 days, so I did make note of that. So thank you for letting us know on that end. Um, but yeah, feel free to use the Q&A, and then I'll just kind of have one really quick poll question after I go through a couple slides. So what should people do now? So on this slide, we have an image of a young man with an intellectual disability and the caption is Medicaid rules have changed. So you wanna make sure Medicaid has your current address and contact info so you don't miss an important notice and you can learn more at medicaid.gov. And then just in terms of what specifically people should do, you wanna make sure the contact information is up to date with state Medicaid agencies be on the lookout for renewal forms from the state Medicaid agency. So that what that was on the um, some of the slides that we had just presented, how much time you have once you get that letter. And again, making sure that um, the renewal forms are being completed and returned in a timely manner. So on the next slide, we have a comic. So our communications manager, Michelle Sales, I don't know if she's on this, but she is very talented in many ways. Um, and one of them is being, um, you know, a, a really gifted artist. So the just kind of like the alt text for this comic, um, and I'll put in the chat if you want to download those. And again, we'll include that in a follow up resource email at the end of this webinar. But Ollie, the alligator, so a navigator, so a little pun there is in his wheelchair in front of a row of houses holding a Medicaid renewal form in his hand. He's about to drop it in the mailbox. So it reads, do you have Medicaid? It's time to renew your coverage make sure you're double checking your coverage. Um, and it can go by a few different na um, names depending on your state. So examples are TenCare, MassHealth, and others. So step one to stay covered, make sure Medicaid has your current information. So like I said, address, phone number, email, complete any renewal forms you might receive. And then finally, find local advocates to support you if needed. So community centers for independent living and navigators are here to help. So what if someone loses coverage? So you're gonna to wanna to find out if there's a procedural reason why the eligibility was terminated and see if this can be corrected. And then if the individual disagrees with the determination, they do have the right to file an appeal. And again, this is gonna vary by state. And Medicaid enrollment is year round so that the individual may be able to immediately reapply and some states do have a waiting period. If the individual is no longer eligible, they are eligible for a special enrollment period on the ACA marketplace. So that's 60 days from the determination.
So our final comic, and again, I put in the chat if people want to download that and, and kind of use it on their, you know, outreach or anything, share with folks. Um, but just the alt text for this. So Ollie the alligator is sitting in his wheelchair getting support with Medicaid renewal. He's distressed reading his Medicaid enrollment notice. He says, I thought I filed everything out to renew. The navigator replies, did you change your income? He says, no, that's not it. So the navigator is replying, you have a few options. If they requested any specific information for your renewal, you can share that now or start a new Medicaid application. And again, there are some waiting periods before you can reapply. And then they say, it seems that you're no longer eligible, but you can qualify for subsidized coverage through the marketplace and you can always file an appeal. And then here are just some resources that we've been able to use a lot um, just in kind of the information that we've been getting. So on our own website, we have a fact sheet. So this is kind of how it relates to people with disabilities. Um, unwinding resources, again, on our um, National Disability Navigator website, then just an FAQ from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and then finally, a 50-state unwinding tracker, so that's from Georgetown, and I will drop these in the chat as well. Again, I'll be emailing this out, so don't um, feel kind of uh, that you need to answer those immediately or save them immediately. And then just a really quick poll before I hand it back over to Carl. Um, this is, again, just to kind of see how folks are feeling. Again, utilize that Q&A chat. Um, but the question is just, how do you feel about your knowledge on the Medicaid unwinding now? So I kind of have the same answers from um, earlier. So amazing, all right, could be better. And hopefully the Q&A, we can alleviate the could be betters. And I'll just give that like 15 more seconds and just kind of see where folks are at. I would also add that uh, as we're waiting for people to respond to that, if people do have questions, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A and we will get to those in a moment. Okay, I'll go ahead and share the results. So a good chunk of people are feeling amazing and all right, and we do have a could be better. So I'm hoping that you can utilize that Q&A for whoever answered um, could be better. And then Carl, I will turn it over back to you. Okay, thank you very much. And yeah, these so these, uh, I will say about the these specific resources, um, mo most of the resources we've been talking about today uh, are also on that blog post, the second one that's uh, listed on this particular resources slide, uh, the Medicaid unwinding resources. So a lot of the ones that we've been talking about and uh, that we've been citing uh, as we've been going through that, you can find those on that blog post if you're looking for specific um, links to uh, uh, things. Uh, and then uh, Nuria mentioned earlier that there is another chat that's happening uh, later today uh, that's with the Action Network. Uh, so this one isn't necessarily disability focused, but obviously we know Medicaid is an important program for people with disabilities. So we do want to highlight this as well. It's uh, happening at 730 Eastern tonight. And that's Let's Talk the Great Unwinding and How to Stay Covered. Uh, Mina Schultz, who we do a lot of work with at the Young Invincibles, is going to be speaking on that. So we would encourage you to go ahead and check that out um, if you are interested and have the time. We mentioned both of our uh, websites uh, throughout the presentation today. So we have some QR codes we will leave up here as we're going through the Q&A. If people want to access those websites on your smartphones, uh, you can use these QR codes. The one on the left is a QR code for um, AHD's main website. And the QR code on the right is for our National Disability Navigator Resource Collaborative, or NDNRC, website. Uh, that's where we do a lot of the news items and that kind of stuff uh, on uh, these types of issues. It's where you'll find that blog post that we mentioned with all the Medicaid unwinding resources. It's where you'll find the fact sheet that we talked about uh, earlier about what uh, folks need to know and do about the Medicaid unwinding. And it's also where you'll find all the Alia, the Navigator comics uh, that Nuria was showing earlier. So uh, that's uh, that's another one I would encourage you to check out. Once again, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And Nuria, do we have any questions? We do. So um, I'll also go ahead and, and type the answers out based off what Arthi and Carl have to add to it. But Michelle Eastman asked, if someone loses coverage, who should they contact to find out what their specific state is doing? 
Yeah, there's lots of great local resources that people can use. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about a, a couple of ways that you can find them. Number one is um, if you go to um, healthcare.gov, um, if your state is on the, um, regardless if your state's on the, uh, the federal healthcare.gov or is has its own state-based marketplace, it will redirect you if you have your own state-based marketplace. But there are navigators in every state that sort of help people figure out what their options are related to coverage. And they can help you um, if you are trying to figure out about whether you can appeal the Medicaid decision or re-enroll in Medicaid. They can help you determine whether or not uh, you have a specific um, option related to finding other health coverage. Uh, we mentioned earlier the special enrollment periods. So uh, they are be able to help you do that. So if you go to healthcare.gov, you can click, uh, there's an option, find local help. You can put in your zip code and uh, they'll be, you'll be able to find a navigator near you. Um, also, the other, other great resource for people with disabilities, if you have a disability, you lose your coverage uh, and are looking for options, Centers for Independent Living are there to help uh, people with disabilities navigate some of these issues and uh, offer uh, support uh, on uh, applying for Medicaid and, and other programs. So I would encourage you to find your local Center for Independent Living. There are um, several of them all across the country. Uh, there, there, there are multiple SILs in every state. So I would encourage you to go ahead and check that out and find the local uh, SIL that's near you and they should be able to provide assistance. Any other questions? Um just the other question so i see that um berta had put in the chat to get the training in spanish so i believe that we could potentially um get that translated the closed captioning um but that is something that we can reach back out to um, our other partners on that so thank you for putting that in the chat berta um, we do have um, medicaid unwinding resources that are already in spanish so again i can share those in the follow-up email um, and then so far the only other question in the chat is um what qualifies as a special enrollment period. And let me go back to the Spanish one as well. CMS also has a lot of uh, Spanish resources uh, on this topic as well. So we can also include that in a, in a follow-up email for folks. Uh, so that, that would be something else that I would also look at. In terms of what qualifies for a special enrollment period, if you lose your coverage, uh, you are automatically eligible for a special enrollment period on um, the ACA marketplaces, that's healthcare.gov or your state-based marketplace. So if you go in there, you indicate you've lost coverage, uh, you are given a special enrollment period to be able to go and get covered as a result. Uh, so that's something to always be looking at. You can always then, because there are there are times, we do a lot of um, outreach in the fall on open enrollment when people can uh, enroll for uh, healthcare uh, coverage during um, the open enrollment period that usually runs uh, from the beginning of November into January. Um, but uh, when you lose coverage because of any reason, it could be because you lost employer-based coverage or you lost uh, your coverage uh, because you know, you're know you no longer eligible for Medicaid uh, in this instance, you do have then an, an option to go in and have a enrollment period on the healthcare marketplace and get covered uh, as a result. There's a whole host of reasons you can also qualify for special enrollment periods, uh, but those are those are two of the main ones that would affect the population we're talking about in today's uh, webinar. Okay, so far I'm not seeing any other questions in the Q and A. So if folks have anything in the next couple minutes that they want to ask, again we will be sending a follow up email with all these resources. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so we will be, um, like Carl had mentioned, CMS does have Spanish-based um, resources as well, and it's in many different languages. So we'll send the resources we have for that and then link back to them. And then the other thing I'll also mention too, um, we will probably take a couple of days to get this um, slide deck formatted and 508 compliant so that uh, you know people with screen readers can use it. But once we do that, we will put it up um, on our, uh, it'll definitely be on the NDNRC website. We'll probably also link to it on the AHD website. Uh, and a recording of this uh, webinar will probably also go up on our, um, will go up on our, our YouTube page. So look for that next week.
got a few minutes, so we'll just wait a, a little bit more to see if anybody has any other questions. Uh, like I said, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, and we're happy to answer any other questions people might have. And then just to kind of add, just as a general observation, so with a lot of the resources that Arthi provided us, we and then just um, speaking on community-based calls, a lot of these redeterminations, a lot of the um, eligibility is um, not working for people just because of procedural issues. So again, that could be due to the state, how their communications, their outreach strategies are, um, as you can see from Arthi's case study that she had done. But also just making sure, I mean, it's just the very simple steps that I had mentioned of making sure all your contact information is up to date and that it's being sent back in that specific timeline. Again, that is, um, it can be a little iffy for people because they don't know specifically, but we're hoping by providing that people can take those steps to get that information to their Medicaid agencies. Wait just a few more moments just to see if there's any last questions that folks have. I am not opposed to ending early. I've got quite a few thank yous, so thank you. And uh, at this time, I want to thank Norea and RT once again. They did a lot of the legwork on doing the research on what was happening uh, on those state maps uh, that we provided. So thank you to them. Also want to thank Katie and Courtney for um, acting as our ASL and the captioner today. Um, we always want to provide fully inclusive uh experiences for everyone with the things we do so i want to thank them for joining us today to provide those services um and we wish all of you a, a good afternoon or if you're on the west coast i guess it's still morning uh so thank you very much for joining us today and we hope you have a good holiday weekend thank you